This film is designed only to share information regarding research and treatment into long COVID. The information is not to be used for any diagnostic or treatment purposes and should not be used as a substitute for professional diagnosis and treatment by a qualified physician. Please consult your healthcare provider before making any healthcare decisions or for guidance about a specific medical condition. Dr. Kane, Helen Oakley, or any of the other participants in this film have no liability for any damages, loss, or injury suffered as a result of information contained in this video being used by individuals for medical purposes. Hi. And welcome to the Long COVID Clinic, What You Can Do. In this episode, Dr. Benita Kane flew to South Africa to meet some of the world's leading experts on microclots. The reason why oxygen isn't getting around the body in the way that it's designed to and potentially causing damage. We speak to world leading experts on the subject. Jackie Lauscher, Dr. Asad Khan and Jez Medinger and world-leading scientist on microclots, Rhesia Pretorius. I'm Helen Oakley, passionate advocate for the charity Long COVID Support. The Long COVID Clinic, what you can do. With Dr. Benita Kane and Helen Oakley. Research into microclots is not new and it predates COVID. In this episode, we follow Dr. Benita Kane as she explores the role of inflammation of blood vessels and abnormal clotting as one of the reasons behind the huge range of symptoms from severe fatigue and pain affecting every organ seen in long COVID. Dr. Benita Kane flew to South Africa in April 2023 to meet one of the world's top long COVID researchers, Rhesia Pretorius, who coined the term microclots and whose work is truly pioneering. We start with Dr. Jaku Lauscher, a clinician who used his experiences treating acute COVID to develop a new approach to treatment. We'll then head to the lab to meet Professor Rhesia Pretorius and her team, have a look at some normal and abnormal results, and then see how this is being applied to clinical practice to treat patients. We hope this video will be useful for healthcare professionals and patients and their loved ones alike. There will be terminology used that perhaps might not be obvious for patients if they're not used to speaking in medical terms. So if you're a healthcare professional, please do skip. I'm just going to explain some really basic terms so that the video can be understood by as many people as possible. First, long COVID. When we say long COVID, we mean the patient coins term, which means a new onset of symptoms, either ongoing or with a delayed onset after an infection of COVID. These symptoms are a huge wide range. And although there are some more common ones, they can be a whole multitude of different things. Once we get into what's behind potentially causing them, that might make more sense as to why the symptoms can be so wide ranging from patient to patient. Vascular. That's just a word for the body's pipe work, arteries, veins, capillaries, platelets. That's the bit of the blood that helps with clotting. It looks like a small disc. Microclots. What we mean by this is when the blood has become very sticky, it's full of tiny little clots that don't generally show up on test for the larger clots that cause heart attacks and strokes. But these microclots can cause a whole range of issues in their own right. Endothelium. This is the lining on the inside of the blood vessels, which oxygen has to cross to get into our tissues and organs. I'm here in Stellenbosch to spend some time with Yaku Lavsha and Risha Pretorius, the pioneers of microclot testing and triple therapy. So I'm going to see how they're doing things differently in South Africa. Tell me a little bit about what you do here. So uh, obviously after our involvement with acute severe COVID, I mean, this whole concept of long COVID came along and initially it was sort of a vague concept where one wasn't really sure, but I think we worked it out quite, quite nicely. Um, it's still got to do with vascular damage, um, uh, you know, the endothelium, the virus, the virus's ability unique ability to damage endothelium, which in the end leads to um, symptoms that may be prolonged and, and, and last longer than what you expect. So mostly patients get referred here yeah, from the periphery, from overseas. Uh, um, and the reason they come here, we've got this unique, uh, you know, developed this unique blood test um, through Risa Petroyes at the University of Stellenbosch identifying abnormal platelet activation and uh, the formation of microclots that indicates endothelial damage. So 
patients uh, first would come here to have their blood taken. Uh, we evaluate that, and if there's evidence that would fit with long COVID, we get them in for a consultation and go through the whole um, history and then the explanation of what is actually about pathology and uh, what the treatment is, what to expect from the treatment, the um, the side effect, the potential side effects, uh, and then our patients get you know there's a follow up uh, on a weekly basis. We in contact via WhatsApp, uh, so I have 515 patients on my cell phone, um, wow. uh, getting messages, um, hopefully usually short messages, um, and. Then after four weeks, the blood test gets repeated, and that together with the patient's symptoms determines the way forward. Okay, so you have the diagnostics, then you do the treatments, you're in constant contact with the patients, and then you repeat the blood test to look at response That's based it. on their symptoms and also what the microclots and the platelets are looking at. And you also have access to some other fancy testing to look at the blood vessel walls. Can you tell yeah. me about that? So we we we're trying to independently, you know, determine that the endothelium uh, is is sick. So the one way to do it is just microscopy. But another way uh, to do that is to look at endothelial functional testing. Um, so that's the ability of the endothelium to mediate a blood vessel dilating or contracting, um, and we do that via endopat system uh, that looks at um, uh, capillary volume in the finger, uh, pre and post an occlusion of, of blood flow, um, and the ability of the artery then or the capillary key, capillary volume to to increase, um, and that will give you indication of endothelial functional testing, and that we are quite uh, sure correlate would correlate with the blood test that we do. Yeah. So it's an independent test to tell you the same thing. Yeah, so you're not only looking at the microscope images, you're also looking at the function yeah. of the blood vessels as well. And I think maybe just on that point, I think another independent way of looking more or less at the same thing is two, as far as I'm concerned, two important blood tests, and that would be VEGF and, and CD40 Liga. And I think that, so the one is an endothelial marker and the other one a, a platelet marker. Um, and they will remain high uh, as long as you have endothelial damage, platelet hyperactivation, microclot formation. So it's also another independent marker to look at the same thing. Yeah, so that's three potential markers of looking at the same thing to tell us the blood vessels are damaged and this is what driving some of the long COVID in symptoms. The end, in the end, failed normal clotting physiology. Um, yeah. And, and that in the end leads to to symptoms and, and obviously it's not a uniform disease in all patients. It's, you know, different patients have, have different uh, symptoms. So there are three ways to look for damage that tell us similar things. You can either look directly for microclots and hyperactive platelets under the microscope. You can measure the springiness of the blood vessels using something called endopat testing, or you can measure markers in the blood that will give information on whether the endothelium is inflamed and whether the platelets are overactive. Don't worry if it's not making much sense yet. We're going to hear much more about this in the rest of the film. So I will be following a journey of a patient along with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Asad Khan, and author of the Long COVID Handbook, Jez Medinger. And we're going to undergo the same process as the patients, minus the consultation and treatment bit, but we'll be getting all the tests done, including the blood tests, the endopat testing, and uh, we're looking forward to learning from you. Hi there, I'm Asad Khan. I'm a respiratory consultant, also a Long COVID patient. Here to get my blood looked at, and also to learn about how they diagnose and treat long COVID in South Africa. Hi, I'm Jess Medinger. I'm the author of the Long uh, COVID Handbook and a patient advocate for the condition. Uh, and like I said, I'm here in South Africa and we're going to be having our blood looked at to see what might be going wrong. Hi, I'm Richard Pretorius. I live in microclots and patient hyperactivation in long COVID patients. Here you can see some of our equipment. My two students, Amel and Maxine, 
sitting right in front of the flow cytometer, the imaging flow cytometer, you will need a microflux in black. And here you can see the Max Planck instrument in Martin Crater from Germany. And we're getting a microfluidics um, of the blood flow in the system. And here is our little thromboelastograph, the check that we see how the blood clots and how the clot forms during activation. So this is PAC-1, and uh, this is CD62P. So these are the two markers that we mark our patients with. It's the green and the reddish pinkish signal. And this is our THT all made up. And this will go into our platelet core plasma to mark the microcounts. I'm also learning preparatory as THT students. Uh, I'm just going to quickly explain to you what the TEG is. TEG stands for thromboelastography. It's basically our way to assess a... Uh, how quickly the blood clots. Now, Massimo's the of the clot explanation gets very technical here. So in the way of a summary, this is a machine that measures how readily the blood can clot. So if the blood is too thick and sticky, it'll clot very quickly. And if it's too thin, it'll take much longer to form a clot. Now, Dr. Labsha was using this technology in the early days of the pandemic on the intensive care with the patients who were really sick with acute COVID-19. And what he found was at first early stages of the illness, their blood became very sticky and would just keep clotting. And they were throwing lots of anticoagulants, antiplatelet drugs at these patients and the blood just kept clotting. But then round about day seven to 10, there would be this inflammatory storm and then the blood could become too thin and the patients would be prone to bleeding and they'd have to really row back all of that treatment. So this technology became really critical in how he managed his patients in the acute phase. And what was really interesting is the patients who survived, he didn't see many of them uh, developing long COVID. In fact, he says he didn't see a single case. So he has taken the principles of what he learned in those uh, early days of the pandemic and applied them to the management of long COVID because we know long COVID is just COVID. It's the same disease process happening just at a different scale. So I'm just placing oil on the objective. So this is the fluorescent microscope now. The fluorescent microscope, fluorescence microscope is, I put oil on it, I put it upside down so the smear has been made there. So perhaps I could just show, perhaps you can just focus here. This is an example of microclots of Yapulopsia's blood. So it's pretty normal, right? Very normal, no no clots. For very little. Food. Yeah, I mean, you can have one or two. You can immediately see more clots. Okay, so that's quite different. Yes. So now I'll focus. So sometimes it's very difficult to focus because some of the clots are, you know, three-dimensional. So the Z level is quite, so you must decide where you want to focus. They're a lot, that's a lot bigger as well than yes. the normal ones that Yaku had. Very much so. And the clots are also much brighter. If you look also at this distribution of the significant fluorescence, uh, this is where the THT binds to, to the open hydrophobic areas of misfolded protein. So if the if THD binds, it's a much brighter color. And so this is a two yeah. clot. Yeah. That we see. You see, it looks as if it's spongy. Yeah. So many times people ask me, well, why don't you see anyone with clots, with these type of microclots, and heart attacks, strokes every day? You know? Yeah. But I think because it looks so it's so spongy, it just squeezes through the capillaries. And it's okay. not actually doesn't actually physically block the vessel. So, so this are... is another clot, Tricia, sorry. So this is a clot, and I think, so the back, this area here is probably a piece of endothelial damage, yeah. and this is a vessel. So these are healthy platelets. They are little small balls, but you will see them uh, activating, perhaps pushing out the pseudopoda here and there. So that is... That is normal because that's their job. If and you put them on the on a slide, that is what and the process of having the blood taken might activate the platelets a little bit. Okay. Exactly. So what you see here is the uh, pink and the green are two different markers for platelets. So the pink one is the 
adhesion molecule. And that's always at the back. But now you can see you can see a little pink tinge there because we're looking at a section. So it's actually a whole ball of plate. Okay, like, they just clumped they together. Have, there are probably hundreds of platelets in there. Okay. And the, the pink receptor that we are marking or the molecule that we're marking then actually can go and attach to your endothelial cells. Right. As you activate endothelial cells, but it can also activate platelets, other platelets. And it can also um, cause microtrons. So this is an anonymized um, example of really severe platelet hyperactivation. Yes. Yeah. And was this per? Would this person have been quite ill? Does it kind of correlate? With yeah, this person was really ill. Yeah. Really, really ill, and um, he was also treated by a There's blood flow, that's the wall of the artery, um, and that little black line there is the inner lining of all arteries and veins. So it's a thin cell layer called the endothelium okay. that coats all arteries and veins, and uh, it's the cell layer also that contains the ACE receptor to which the spike protein of the virus binds to infect it and damage it. Uh, the cell layer... Uh, you know, has many different functions. Amongst others, it prevents clotting. So there's platelets and clotting factors flowing here, but it's not clotting until you get damage to the endothelium that exposes underlying tissue factor von Willebrand. There are proteins that if it gets into contact with blood, it activates platelets and the enzymatic pathway of clotting to form a clot to heal the injury. So that's mm. our clotting mm. work. So mm. when platelets activate, they become from a smooth little disc. They enlarge, they push out these extensions to attach to each other or to the injury. So they form like the scaffolding of a clot. And the enzymatic pathway of clotting is a lot of proteins that interact and activate one another in the end forming thrombin or fibrin. That's, that's uh, proteins that slot into the scaffolding to form a strong clot. So you cut yourself, you injure endothelium, you form a clot to heal that uh, that injury. Mm. So at the same time that you form a clot, the body starts breaking down clot. Uh, it's an enzymatic process where you, uh, you know, with your own enzymes break down clot to maintain or contain clotting locally. Mm. Otherwise, every time you cut yourself, the whole system clots up, mm. blood mm. stops mm. flowing. So the balance between breakdown and clot formation is important. So in COVID, the, the damage to the endothelium is so widespread that the body's ability to maintain normal clotting physiology fails. So you have many areas where platelets get activated and they form these aggregates, they clump together and the enzymatic pathway of clotting to form microclots and together with endothelial damage causes a problem with oxygen transfer on a local tissue capillary small blood vessel uh, level. And you need that oxygen for the battery of the cell, the mitochondria. The mitochondria uses oxygen to produce energy to maintain all normal cellular processes. So it's very interesting, not all organs in your body has got the same partial pressure of oxygen under normal circumstances. So the lung is at the highest, you inhale 21% oxygen, so the lung sits at 100 to 110 millimeters mercury. The brain sits at 35. So the brain is very sensitive to low oxygen levels, hypoxemia. So the brain, skin, muscle, eye, vestibular apparatus, placenta, and bone are the organs with the lowest partial pressure of oxygen. And that's where, that's where all the symptoms of long COVID comes from. Okay. But okay, not everybody has all the symptoms. It's, it's a skip <laughs> disease. It's, some have more brain symptoms, which may be word finding, short-term memory, can't do maths all of a sudden. Planning of your day, uh, you know, organization, concentration, that's typical brain fog types. And so some have more than more of that. 
Are those type of symptoms, some have more than muscle type symptoms, fatigue, chest pain, palpitations, uh, any exertion makes them extremely tired, they have to go and lie down and, and rest. Uh, so some have dominantly that, some have all the symptoms, so it's, it's not mm -hmm. uniform in all patients. So what we've been able to do with the research at, uh, together with Risa Patois at the University of Stellenbosch, she's been able to develop a blood test that shows up these microclots yeah. and uh, platelet activation, which is not a test done commonly at, at, at an ordinary lab. So what we do, we take your blood, we centrifuge down the cells and so you're left with plasma that's water and uh, you stain that with theoflavin that's a minifluorescent stain that binds to unfolded protein and you look under a fluorescent microscope and this is basically what you see so there's there's two little green dots mm -hmm. this is what it should look like all of us has got little pieces of protein floating about. Could be thrombin, fibrinogen, amyloid-like protein. So that's normal. This is COVID. Sure. Same magnification. Mm -hmm. And that consists of stripped endothelium, von Willebrand's platelets, complement, thrombin, fibrinogen, amyloid. It's like a sticky, it's like a jelly baby. Mm -hmm. And it can't dissolve. So those are the microclots. So a, a blood clot in your lung or in car vein uh, is, we measure in centimeters. It's a big thing, yeah. you know, four or five centimeters. Compared to this, this is 20 to 200 micron. Yeah. It's tiny. Yeah, it's so you can't see with your eye, but it's not supposed to be there. Yeah. So those are the microclots. Platelets are smooth little discs, um, and when they activate, they become bigger and have these extensions and clump together forming aggregates. So there are two normal platelets. Mm -hmm. That's how it's supposed to look. Uh, you can really see on them on the surface, they form these little extensions. And platelets are unbelievable. As you prepare the slide, you put a little cover slip on the slide, it already starts activating. It's a mm -hmm. really underestimated little cell in COVID. So they that's COVID, long COVID, many more platelets, larger platelets clumping together. And the green and the purple are two specific platelet surface markers. So we know what we're looking at. Okay. Platelets. Yeah. So between the platelet aggregates, the microclots, the you know, jelly babies, Ooh. and the theater damage, there's the problem with oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. So we can go and have a look at your blood. On the, on the platelets, you probably have three out of four. We have a visual scale out of four. So depending on the amount and the extent and, uh, you know, uh, at the terminus, uh, the, the uh, classification. And on the uh, uh, microclots, you probably have two out of four. So that's enough to cause symptoms. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're otherwise healthy, you shouldn't see any of this in your blood. The fact that it's there means you've got endothelial damage. That's why it's there. Mm -hmm. So if I have something to fix the endothelium, it's easy. We can all go home. We'll be fine tomorrow. But that doesn't exist. So what I can uh, control is clotting. So by, by controlling clotting, you prevent new clot from forming. You, you must remember, you, you've been walking around with this for eight months now. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter where I take the blood, if it's an artery or a vein, or it's the same all over. Mm -hmm. um, so you, on the one hand, you prevent new clot from forming. On the other hand, the ones that are already there, you give your body's enzyme systems uh, an opportunity to dissolve, which is already there. And by doing that, you're giving the endothelium an opportunity to heal. So you can, you must see this as a as a, a river, this artery, with most of the water and a few cells flowing in the middle. Mm. And on the sides, you get the cells hugging the sides. Mm. 
And now on top of that, you've got these platelet aggregates and microclots. And that's causing sheer stress. It's causing, uh, it's preventing endothelium from recovery. Um, recovery. And, and by controlling the clotting, we're trying to lessen the burden there and then for the endothelium to, to recover. So forget about code for the mo moment. So let's say you've got chest pain, you go to a cardiologist, he says, well, you've got a narrowed coronary artery and he puts a balloon and a stent in. Then you damage your endothelium. But if five days later you could look down the artery, you won't see the stent even because it's already covered in, in, uh, in endothelium. So the endothelium has got the ability to recover and that's what we're trying to achieve. Mm. So you could say, well, give me half a dispin and then we thin the blood a bit. And so that's better than nothing. But it's not going to be enough to inhibit platelets. So, by the way, if you get a stent and a balloon in the stent of your artery, you'd be put on clopidogrel and aspirin, it's two antiplatelet drugs, to prevent the stent from clotting up. I use those two drugs for exactly the same reason to prevent platelet activation. If you had a condition called atrial fibrillation, it's, it's an irregular heart rhythm that may lead to a small clot forming in the heart and if it breaks loose it can go to your brain and cause a stroke you put be put on a blood thinner that inhibits the enzymatic pathway of clotting in the old old days it would be warfarin rat poison or the newer modern uh, uh, warfarin's uh, zeralto pradaxa aliquis uh, and and that prevents the stroke so i use that drug for exactly the same reason to inhibit the enzymatic pathway of clotting. So you could say, well, give me one of those. And so you do the, you know, it, it'll do its job there, but then you don't inhibit the platelets. Mm -hmm. So single drug therapy won't work. Mm -hmm. Platelet drugs doesn't work on the enzymatic pathway. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be combination uh, treatment uh, to have a chance to heal this the problem. Um, so it's a lot of blood thinning that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So obviously, Bleeding uh, may be a risk factor um, or, or, or a risk. So in in the trials done on atrial fibrillation with these new modern drugs that we have, acceptable severe adverse bleeding events was between 25 and 3.5%. That's actually quite high if I think about it. That's for single drug therapy. So I use three drugs and so far, in over 500 patients, my serious adverse bleeding is less than 1%. I think what it shows also is a difference in pathology. So in atrial fibrillation or the stent that you get in your heart, we're trying to thin the blood more than usual to prevent a clot. In long COVID, your blood is sticky. It's like honey. And we're trying to get it like water. And to do that, you need a lot of treatment. But we're just trying to get it back to normal clotting physiology, not thin it more than usual. Um, so um, I, I think the treatment is actually quite safe, despite mm -hmm. the potential for bleeding. All right, it, it is blood thinners that you take. So you bump yourself, you're going to have a blue mark. It's common. We see that. We see it often. It doesn't bother me. You know, it, it, it will happen. Um, you blow your nose hard or you fiddle with a tissue up your nose, there's small little blood vessels in, in front. You may break a blood vessel causing a nose bleed too. So don't do that. Be careful. If you slip in the shower, you dump your head, you may have a brain bleed, which is a potentially life-threatening condition. So be careful. Your treatment is not going to be forever. But like a brain bleed goes for aspirin as well. You know, it's not, it's without potential problems. Part of the treatment is a drug to suppress stomach acid output. Uh, we don't want you to develop a stress ulcer and erode a blood vessel that may lead to internal bleeding. So we, we add that to treatment. Um, and so certain things are just common sense. Uh, you can't go for chiropractic manipulation, uh, acupuncture, you know, deep massaging with an elbow in a muscle is going to cause a big blue mark. Uh, you're not really into contact sport, probably, um, or downhill racing with your bicycle. You can't do that. Uh, so anything that may lead to a risk, increased risk of bleeding, you should avoid. Um, <clears throat> the memoir that you're on, that you can continue with that. 
So what to expect? It's not magic. You start today and tomorrow everything is fine. I think you know, we've identified two groups, the short, long COVID and long, long COVID. So short, long COVID is symptoms less than six months. Uh, treatment usually there, three to four months, and the chance of a complete recovery is excellent compared to long, long COVID. Symptoms more than six months, and that's in your, in your case. Um, you're probably going to need four to six months, maybe longer a treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, and there may be symptoms that I just can't fix. It's it's like having a stroke. You get to your doctor, you get the right medication. The next day you're a lot better, but you're not 100% because you got there a little bit too late. So yeah. there's already scar tissue formed and you, know, you can't fix that. So time will tell how much mm -hmm. you will be able to recover. And, and often it is a slow incremental recovery on a monthly basis so it's not yeah. like that and everything yeah. is fine <clears throat> it will take time and probably the first three four weeks nothing's going to happen i don't think you'll feel any different the odd patient would report a change very quickly in the next week uh, even but i don't expect that so the end of the third to the end of the fourth week, probably you will experience a worsening of current symptoms or even maybe new symptoms starting. And that to me is a good sign. It indicates that, you know, the microplots, the jelly babies are starting to dissolve. They release a lot of antigens, proteins. Your body's immune system responds to that. And that may cause new symptoms, a skin rash, new aches and pains, maybe a headache, um, whatever. That's temporary, a few days, maybe a week or, or two, and then the recovery starts. So I like it when a patient phones and says, this is the worst I've felt ever. Your, mm. your medication is poisoning me. That's the start of recovery. And then usually, as I say, incremental in, uh, improvement over a month or on a monthly basis. Systemic inflammation, any new infection may worsen symptoms uh, Temporary, so you get a cold, a influenza, bladder infection, you know, tooth abscess. Um, that is usual. It, it it doesn't have to be COVID. Any any new any form of in systemic inflammation may cause a setback, and it's because that inner lining of the endothelium is is not uh, yes. recovered completely. Um, once you stay healthy for long enough and the endothelium recovers, it becomes resilient and can manage these uh, systemic inf inflammatory uh, states. Um, okay, so what you do, uh, I'm going to give you a prescription. So I'm here having my endopat test done, which is a marker of how well the endothelium or the lining of the blood vessels is working. And here's Dr. Lovesha. He's going to explain what we're doing. So um, the endothelium, of course, is, is responsible for your muscular arteries to be able to dilate, open up, reduce pressure or contract, uh, increase uh, peripheral resistance and, and pressure that way. So that's quite important in the regulation of, of blood pressure. So this endopat machine measures the ability of the endothelium to direct arteries to dilate. Um, so it's, it's done via sort of a, a little monitor or a, a um, probe that that you insert your finger into, and that measures capillary volume. And what we then do, we do an occlusion test where uh, you know we stop blood flow with a uh, blood pressure cuff, we we'll inflate it to 50 millimeters mercury above your own systolic, that stops blood flow for five minutes. And when you release that uh, occlusion, the increased blood flow stimulates the endothelium to secrete nitrous oxide. That's a chemical that stimulates the, the smooth muscle to relax and dilate. And that dilatation should be, in a healthy person, 30% above baseline. So basically, imagine the artery is like, or the blood vessel is like a hose pipe, but a kind of a springy hose pipe, yeah. not a stiff one. Yeah. 
So you, you should, it's like standing on the hose pipe for a bit. And then when you let go, it should spring open yeah. a bit. So that increased flow then stimulates the inner lining in the yeah. And it should expand. Do that. But if you've got a really stiff hose pipe, you, well, won't, yeah, you won't see the reaction. Yeah. Okay, great. Lab methods are still in the research phase. Validation and reference ranges are planned as the next steps. The bloods have shown that I still have quite significant plated abnormalities. And I do have my clots again. The real shock for me was the state of my endothelium, which um, uh, was quite dysfunctional. In fact, Dr. Kloch said it was the worst he'd ever seen. So whilst this was disappointing, it, it kind of is a bit of a relief because I feel like I've got an explanation for why I have noticed a deterioration over the past few months, both in terms of fatigue and energy levels. And it's a shame that I had to come all this way to get these diagnostics, to be able to find out that I need to go back on to the anticoagulant treatment. So it's been worthwhile, but yeah, wish we had these things closer to home. The other thing is that it's sort of inspired me to try and emulate the sort of precision medicine practice in the UK as and when I'm able to do so. So I'm back from South Africa now and I've had a little bit of time to process uh, my results. Um, and going into receiving those results and seeing the blood and the fluorescent microscopy, you're in sort of two minds. Do you want to have um, to see a set of bloods that shows that they're <laughs> a real mess? Um, because at least then it's validating and you've got something to go after and something to treat, or be it showing you that something's very wrong? Um, or do actually do you want a really good set of results? But the flip side of that is that you don't quite know what to, what to go after in terms of how do you you know, what path do you go down for treatment? As it happened, my results were kind of in the middle. So I've got quite a difficult decision to make coming up about whether I choose to go on the anticoagulants because it's likely to be, um, you know, six months or more on them and that will have an impact on the sorts of things I choose to do. So right now there's, there's still quite a lot to think about. So a few reflections on me. Uh, last few days have been really, really interesting. Um, I think what has struck me is having the right diagnostic tests, being able to prescribe the drugs based on the abnormality seen in the blood, the way that Dr. Lobsha is monitoring the drugs, so testing whether they're working or not, and if they're not, they're being tweaked and changed, and, and then following the progress with questionnaires. And it's just that precision that personalised approach with the diagnostics and the monitoring, which is why I think he's had such great results with his patients. And so that's definitely something that we need to bring to the UK. So that's it from South Africa. I hope this has been useful. Thanks for watching. Please do like and subscribe for future films.